Jen, thank you so, so much for being back on the show. This is your second time on the Mary Marian show. And I have been looking forward to this since we got it on the calendar. So thanks for being here. First of all. Oh my goodness. Absolutely. I appreciate you having me back. Yeah. So we're here to talk about simple and free, which was originally released as seven. Um, you bringing it back simple and free seven experiments against excess. And I was just wondering, like, tell us a little bit about the story of like how it came to be that, you know, it is being re-released. Like, what was it about now in particular that you just felt like people needed this message again? Yeah. Um, it's so funny because, you know, I've written 12 or 13 books and absolutely no book that I have ever written. Do people want to talk to me more about than yeah. this one? Still. Yeah. And it just, it just has legs and it just keeps going. And weirdly, it keeps getting more relevant, not less. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I originally wrote it as seven a decade ago. And I, I know more now. I've learned more now. We've collectively learned more now. This has even more impact. And I'm like, 10 years ago, I only had a fraction of my community yeah. um, in terms of my social community. Um, and now, so this is going to be a new project for most of my readers. And so I went back through, it's completely revised and updated and spent the last year on it. Mm. And I am, it's so weird. I'm just as excited about these ideas and these practices as I was the first go around. So yeah. it's funny because, you know, right before you and I started recording, you asked me, is there something you're sick of <laughs> answering, which I love that, but really I told you no because this project is fun to talk about. It's, mm. it's a great discussion point. It's so interesting. It's so high impact. And so, yeah. so here we are updated and ready to roll it out into this next decade. Yeah. And I love something that was really important to you is that rather than just like, you know, deleting or rewriting places yeah. that you have grown since then, or you you've changed yeah. or you wish you would have said something differently. You leave it as is. And then in just br you know, brackets, 2021 yeah. talks to 2010 Jen, which I love. And you say you're going to do it with a lot of like patience and like tenderness towards, you know, you were, you feel like you were, yeah. you said I was still learning and, and gosh, I hope like we're all still learning. Um, but, but talk a little bit about like some places where you're like, Oh, yeah. that did not age well. Like I have to you like know, even I pop culture stuff. I, I kept all the pop culture because I was yeah. like, you guys, look at what we were all watching and listening to 10 years ago. <laughs> Some of it's the same. American yeah. Idol, Grey's Anatomy, still on, you guys. That yeah. really, really had a lot of longevity. Um, but yeah, no, there were other places as I was going back through realizing, wow, uh, that is not what I think anymore. Hmm. Maybe it's not what I believe anymore. Uh, maybe it's just something I hadn't experienced yet. I didn't have an understanding of it. I had no exposure to a different perspective. Some of it were terms and words yeah. that I no longer put into play. I have, they are, they are offensive or they are appropriating. And so, um, I found enough of those going through. Then I just thought, I told my editor, I could obviously just delete all these out of the revised version and mm. as if I never wrote it, but I feel like this is an opportunity to model what it looks like to grow yeah. and to change and then to do better. Mm. And so, yeah, I went back through in all those places, um, places like, for example, where I talked in a certain way about people living in poverty. Yeah. Words I assigned to that community, ways in which I had an us and them mentality. And rather than just fixing it and doing better, yeah. I bracketed it and said, okay, 2010 Jen, I want to explain something to you that you just didn't know then. That's right. Um, you were you were doing the best you could, but you're not gonna talk like this anymore. And here's why. Here's what you learned. Yeah. And I, those are all throughout the book. And my editor was like, are you, sure? <laughs> Are you sure? I'm like, yes, because I think it's important also that my community knows that growth and evolution is not something to be ashamed about. It's something to celebrate. Yeah. And I hope, I hope that 10 years from now, I will have to go back through this manuscript again and bracket it to 2021 gin yeah. and be like, here's just something you didn't know yet. Here's just something you hadn't experienced. And so hopefully Hopefully we continue to do this, all of us. And I hope I hope to set that example for my readers in addition mm. to putting all this content in front of them. Yeah. You know, one of the ones that I really like, it kind of caught me by like, ooh, like that's powerful to think about is 
you were talking about, there's a part where you say like, you know, what I do for the least of these. And the bracket is like, whoa, Jesus can say that. You don't get to say that. And I was like, oh, dang. So just talk a little bit about that. Like what, you know, what you've learned in that, in that particular one. And like, you know, what, what 2010 Jen thought she was saying, I guess, or like where, you know, that was coming from. You mentioned it being something like Christianese or what have you. So just talk a little bit about that. Um, and 2010 at the original writing, this was early, earlier in my personal sort of journey Mm. in terms of, um, living a bit more of an outwardly facing faith, um, less just introspective me, mine, what can I learn? What can, but more like what's going on in my community, what's going on in the world? Um, where are things inequitable? Where are things unfair? Where is Mm. a, a disproportionate suffering, um, And so I was younger in my experiences then. And so some of the things were these sort of catchy, churchy terms Mm. that privileged, mostly white people Mm. would put into play in terms of the communities that they were serving or the people that they were, um, they were serving and things like the least of these, which of course is a scriptural term. That's where it came from. Um, it came from, from Matthew 25, but employed out of Jesus mouth is one thing, right? <laughs> you know, whatever you've done for the least of these you've done for me. Yeah. Um, Jesus gets to say that. But when, when I say that I went back and just cringed, mm. cringed at the condescending, yeah white saviorism type of language that I had. I was just flying off my fingertips. Mm. Um, we're here to help. I'm here to serve. I'm here to save. Yeah. Um, so it didn't have any dignity inside of it. it. It wasn't human. It wasn't, we belong to each other. It wasn't, um, this is actually what I learned from you. This is what you teach me. This is what, um, how you serve me. Mm. It was very one-sided top down language. And so, right. um, I've learned about that since. Mm. And we will do better. And as it turns out, um, when it poverty and the the poorly the poor distribution of resources does not make a does not make a rich and poor category true. Mm. Um, um, Ten years in, I have learned so much from people all across the spectrum, and they have been my teachers and my mentors. Um, and so I, I no longer ha- hold myself in some category of fixer, helper, server, savior. Yeah, I love that. And and the the original version of the book was written in the context and in the time of you had already gone through the interrupted um, seat, stage uh, where you had been at a very big church making, yeah. you know, a good income, your family was good, good house and all of those things. And then you decide to walk away from that and start this church where most of what comes in is going back out to the point of like the carpet is, you had seen the Nixon era and like the the driveways all, the parking lots all messed up. And so you were already writing this book or, or taking part in this experiment from a place of being way outside of your comfort zone, like having these conversations, um, while you were serving with people that you hadn't necessarily come face to face with yet. Um, So based in that context, the seven areas, when you kind of took a look and said, what are like the seven places where I feel like there's too much of an attachment that I want to see what happens if I pull back in them, you know, each, each area one month, what were the seven areas? Like Mm -hmm. walk us through those and like why those felt like, yeah, that's, I need a heart check there. Mm -hmm. Um, I, at the time I had this very deep sense of being entrapped mm. and just absolutely sunk under stuff and spending and waste and purchases. And I just thought, ah, I know that I have too much of everything. Mm. I don't know what to do. I yeah. just do not know what to do. I don't know how to imagine a different way. I don't know how to think through a different path, through what it means to be a faithful consumer on this earth. I have no idea what to do. So, yeah, because I don't know how to do anything subtly. That's how, that's mm-hmm. how seven and now simple and free was born out of this idea. So the, we took seven areas where at least in my personal life, I felt completely sunk mm. under, but I think this is probably true collectively for us as well. So it was food, 
clothes, media and technology, spending, possessions, waste, and stress. And in yeah. every single category, I could say carte blanche, too much of too much of that. Yeah. And so I took, spent a month on each idea, and for that month, boiled down my options in that category to just seven things. So like, for example, I ate the same seven foods for a month. Mm -hmm. I wore the same seven pieces of clothes for a month. I gave away seven things a day that we owned for a month, only mm -hmm. spent money in seven places for a month, etc. And so accompanied by, it was kind of in the spirit of a fast. Yeah. This very intentional restraint, not meant to be permanent. I'm not going to eat the same seven foods for the rest of my life, mm -hmm. but in the spirit of a fast, what would happen? Like, mm -hmm. what would happen? Well, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what I'm going to learn. I don't know what I'm going to discover. I don't know what I'm going to see, but I want to, I want to try because I don't know what else to do. Yeah. So in addition to sort of these, this, this practice of restraint, pretty absurd restraint at the time, it was, it was accompanied by a lot of learning, tons of research, tons of listening, tons of studying. What is the food supply? Um, what is the, um, labor chain? What is our carbon footprint, like what's going on with climate change? How do my purchases, mm -hmm. how does my consumer power affect these systems? I learned so much. I have never learned so much in one calendar year. Yeah. Um, as my bibliography is this long in mm -hmm. that book, everything that I read, everything that I studied. And then ultimately, so the practices were not permanent, but a lot of the results were. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, one of the lines that's like, even in the, I think just in the opening, the, the update, it says, why do we pursue more when we be happier with less? And you have this quote that says, excess has impaired perspective in America. We are the richest people on earth praying to get richer. We're tangled in unmanageable debt while feeding the machine because we feel entitled to more. We have too much and it is ruining us. And you talk specifically about if you make $35,000 a year, you're in the top 4% of wealth in the world yeah. and 50,000 top 1%. And you, you kind of like balance that, those, you know, statistics and like the worldview with, but we were surrounded by extreme affluence, which tricks you into thinking you're in the middle of the pack. Right. You're in the middle exactly. of the pack. So for the people listening for, you know, beyond digging into this book, which is incredible and they should do, but like, what is a good way? Is it travel? Is it seeing it firsthand? Is it doing research? Yeah. I mean, especially now when it's hard to travel, like how do we get out of that? But the houses to the left and the right are bigger. So I feel pretty normal, yeah. pretty average. Yeah. yeah. That's the problem is that most of us are m mostly what we would consider ordinary. Mm -hmm. We live in ordinary enough houses and we have a life somewhere feels kind of in the middle. Yeah. Um, and so it's really easy for us to think about rich people and just absolutely apply that to somebody else. You know, yeah. um, the, they are rich. That is what rich looks like. This is what ordinary looks like. Mm. Um, but that's not actually true. We, um, we are absolutely at the top of the food chain and that's not a reason to feel guilty. That's not, this is not a guilt thing, by the way, none of simple and free is like, it's not a guilt machine. Mm -hmm. It's not a template. It's not a rule book. It's more like what's actually kind of going on. Mm -hmm. um, because the truth is our, our stuff is not actually making us happier. Yeah. It, it is over promising and under delivering. I mean, we are the targets of a, of billion dollar markets yeah. aimed at getting us to spend. Mm. This is the thing that you need. This is the thing that'll make you happy. This get this and then you're there, but yeah. it's not true. It really isn't true. Um, we're unhappy with our stuff. The majority of Americans report feeling overwhelmed with clutter. Mm. Um, absolutely overwhelmed with spending, um, way, way, sunk in debt more than we're admitting. Yeah. That's a, that's a little private misery mm -hmm. that most of us are carrying around. Mm -hmm. Um, and so the ROI here is not great. Right. And what's interesting, what I learned when I did this experiment in my own life, it was just to see, I really didn't know what was going to happen. Like what would happen if I apply the concept of less to a bunch of these things? Yeah. Cause they're, these are not actually making me happy. I'm mm -hmm. not happy to have almost 350 items in my closet. That mm -hmm. did not, I, zero joy. Like, yeah. I'm not happy. Um, I'm not happy with the millions of stuffed drawers and closets and shelves and garages. 
not happy. Just, yeah. just didn't do it. So I thought, what if we apply less to these categories? What will happen? And what I discovered, like the incredible discovery is that all these other categories over here, the ones that I actually love, the, the categories that we actually care about that matter, that mean something, our relationships, our people, mm. compassion, generosity, simplicity, those all get to become more. Yeah. It is a good trade-off. I mean, a really good trade-off, but it's so challenging to believe it. You just keep yeah. thinking, no, no, more <laughs> stuff is the thing. Right. More is the thing. Um, and so that is what Simple and Free is here for. It's a little bit of a, it's like, let's just see what happens. Mm. Like, let me put this in your hands. Yeah. Let's just see what it does. In my life, I know I've written, I think I've written 13 books. There is no singular book that has created such a response mm. than this. Yeah. None. Mm. I was shook <laughs> by how my reading community responded when it first came out. It never occurred to me mm. one time that anybody would want to try this or do it in their own lives or families or some version of it. Yeah. Never occurred to me. And so when people started reading it and going, we're doing this, I'm going to do this with my small group. We're going to do this with our family. My Bible study is going to read this together and we're going to, pra we're going to do a, you know, some elements of these. I couldn't believe it. And then to start hearing what it was doing in people's lives. I mean, to this day, I cannot even, I can't take it. Like people sold their houses and they downsized and they moved and they started churches and they started nonprofits and they, there was such incredible transformation in yeah. people's lives through this, that to great and glorious effect. I'm like this one, this still has its place in the world. It mm -hmm. really does. And yeah. so um, I think it's a good it, time to yeah. like coming out of this last insane year where everybody's kind of like, we just took all of the, I don't know, dominoes or chips or whatever you want to call them and threw them in the air. And we're going to see what sticks. We're going to see what lands. We're going to see coming yeah. on the other side of this, what actually matters. And like I clung to in this time and like what everything else that needs to fall away. And I love that you talk about, um, you know, you're, you're, you're talking about like $13,000 is the number that is correlated with personal satisfaction per person. And beyond yeah. that, it's yep. very marginal beyond totally. 13,000. And then you yep. also say like, where have I substituted the American dream for God's kingdom? And I was like, oh, geez. Oh, no, it's painful. Yeah, it's painful. it is. And we're going to get into this later. I'm somebody who grew uh -huh. up in, um, this is the trailer that I grew up in. I don't know if you can see that right there. Yeah. And, and like, for me, like the American dream was like, I, you know, I am the American dream. Like, yeah. you know, went out and went to law school and all this other stuff. And I have been chasing that. And this book is like that, like pinprick of like, are you sure? Like, yeah. are you sure this is, are you sure yeah. this is like what you're looking for? I want to dig in for a second to the earthly treasure side. You have this beautiful line that says, Jesus knew what he was talking about when he told yeah. us not to store up too many treasures on this earth, but to live well and love well, because as it turns out, this is what matters more than anything. So very quick story I had when Justin, my husband and I were engaged, I had a great aunt, Annie, aunt Annie, fiery yeah. red hair, five foot two, my grandma's sister in every way, like force in our family tree. She passed away and I inherited a life insurance and then also a hope chest she had been keeping for me in the hope that I got married one day, mm -hmm. uh, which turned out to be an entire storage unit. And we went to Columbus, wow. Ohio and had to rent a 26 foot Penske truck, the Mercy. biggest truck they make yeah. to drive it back to Connecticut. When we got it home inside was the most random collection of things mm -hmm. from Crystal Tiffany Bowl. She had found a, wow. a tag sale. It was all from like Goodwill mm -hmm. and tag sales to a box of little plastic angel ornaments that had melted in the heat and looked like they were crying plastic tears. Terrifying. Terrifying. So terrifying. Uh -huh. And it made me think like, this is the, ep the epitome of we can't take it with us. She yeah. intended for me to have it regardless, but here is what she spent a lifetime gathering up. And to mm -hmm. me, I'm going through it and I'm like, most of this stuff we're going to give away. Totally. Most of this stuff is not going to become my memory of her will become the inheritance, you yes. know? And, um, I was, we, if you haven't seen it yet, the second minimalist documentary on Netflix, less is now, I think they call it. Mm. Um, he kicked off becoming a minimalist cause he had to go through his mom's stuff and he just realized all yeah. the junk we mm. hold on to. So, so talk about that a little bit, this idea of we don't get to take it with us anyway. Like, like how extreme do we want to go with that? 
Uh, yep. Yep. It's so true. That's a real, um, sort of cataclysmic moment for a lot of people Yeah, when they begin going through the stuff left behind by somebody they loved mm. and realize, Oh no, it really, it not only can you not take it with you, it's a burden. And, <laughs> Um, I've heard that story many, many times and it's always true. And I wish we would listen because I think the trick here is that we don't believe it in real time. We mm. only believe it after the fact. Yeah. And it feels like, you know, I grew up in a pretty conservative Christian tradition and my sense of God growing up was that he was just a real drag mm. and that he is the happiest when I was the most miserable. Mm. So I understood God in a way that he was, he wanted me to not have joy, happiness. I felt like faithfulness was going to be whenever I was the most probably mis misery equaled faithfulness. So I thought yeah. I will finally be on God's good side. If I'm probably a missionary in a very remote village, cut off from everything that I love Mm -hmm. And all my people, and that would that's probably what the pinnacle of faithfulness looks like. That's how I understood mm -hmm. God, um, mm -hmm. that He is a buzzkill, and that when He's saying this stuff to us, like "Don't store up all these treasures on earth," I'm like, "Buzzkill, God! Yeah, you're such a buzzkill. You don't want us to have any fun on this earth. You don't want us to have happiness. You don't want us to have joy." Um, but what I've learned as an adult, you know, is that God is absolutely like a God of abundance. He loves us. He loves our joy. Like he loves our happiness. He's for us. He's for love. He's for connection. He's for everything that's good. Yeah. Like everything that's good, everything that really fulfills us ultimately. And so I believe that now mm. I understand that now. Yeah. So having that grid, if God and Jesus too, man, Jesus hammered this idea. I mean, about 25% of his messages had something about this embedded in it Yeah, when he was best. So if, if they have asked us so many times in scripture to consider that these treasures on earth are meaningless, it's not because they want us to live in a tent in the woods. Mm -hmm. It's not because um, anything that brings us pleasure um, should be suspect or that they don't want us to have beauty in yeah. our lives or it, they must know something. I yeah. think God knows something that's true. Yeah. And that's what I discovered in this project is it was such a like throw it against the wall and let's just see. Yeah. And what I learned after almost an entire calendar year of doing this is that actually on the other side of these practices is life, like mm. so much life. Yeah. So much joy. Everything that I love, you begin, those categories get to grow. Mm. And it's true here. This is not just a bummer. I, I cannot tell you how many times when it first came out at seven, people were like, I don't want to read that. Yeah. <laughs> ah, they still tell me that. I don't want to read that. Yeah. Not, uh -uh, not this year. I'm not in the mood for that. I'm like, <laughs> all I can tell you is it, this is not the drag you think it is. Yeah. It really isn't. This is the way I think to live most abundantly on this earth mm. out of the space of simplicity and generosity and connection. This is the good stuff. Yeah. It really is. Yeah. Good stuff. I love that. Everything you're saying. And then also just like the parts in um, the food chapter where you're talking about all of the chemicals and the ingredients and all this stuff. It reminds me. So I, I pulled out this one sentence had this word insatiability and I pulled that out, made it a big header in my questions. And it reminded me um, there's a quote from Sean Aniquist in Present Over Perfect, and it's one of my favorite quotes. I just want to read it to you really quickly. It says, I feel like I'm driving a car 100 miles an hour with music blaring out of open windows. I screech into a parking lot, throw the car in park, sprint into 7-Eleven, and race to the back of the store. I throw my head under the Slurpee machine and fill my mouth with red Slurpee, tons and tons running down my face and neck, gulping and gulping, sticky red, corn syrupy sludge, more and more, until I stand up smeared and dripping and race back for the car, onto the next thing, jamming the car into reverse music at mind numbing volume. That's how I feel. And what I want is one strawberry in total silence, not a hundred miles an hour, no music, no fake red mess all over my face and neck. I want one real strawberry and I don't know how to get from there to here. Yeah. And I was like, Oh, it. that's just so mm -hmm. true. And I think like, that's what your book does. It, it yeah. identifies. Yeah. We are all trying to subsist on like guzzling more that's and right. more and fake and chemical. And yeah. we are missing the joy that God has for us in one 
perfect strawberry. Cause, yeah. Because the more overshadows that. Um, more is tempting. Yeah. More is tempting. It is tempting. And we, that's a message we've received since the day we were born. Mm. Uh, and so it's not neutral. It is not neutral. And nor, it, nor are the markets screaming for our attention. I mean, yeah. this is on purpose. This mm-hmm. is intentional. This system that we find ourselves inside of. So it's not like we all accidentally stumbled into greed and insatiability and mm-hmm. indulgence. Yeah. We're, this is designed. It's designed. So that said, it does require a pretty countercultural energy mm. to reimagine it. This is not going to come easily necessarily. I think this is why people are like, I don't want to do this. I don't want to read this book. This is going to require something of me. And it will. But I think the 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 reward, like the on the back end, what we end up receiving is so surprising, mm. so beautiful and wonderful. But it it, do, it is a conversation that is rare. Yeah. I mean, nope. How many people are talking about doing this? None that I know. Everyone is, they are escalating and elevating, yeah. not really, not bringing it down lower to the ground. I, I don't see it very often. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you have this, this, this series of questions. What in my life, if taken away, would alter my value or identity? What causes an unhealthy change of attitude, personality, or focus when it becomes threatened? What is the thing outside of God that I put everything else on hold for? These were three questions in a sermon at your church that hit you really hard during that first, the Mm. first early days of the food chapter. And I was curious, and I think like, it's only fair, maybe I'll settle in here and answer too. like 10 years later, uh, 11 years later, what would your answer to those questions be now? You know, like you went through the experiment, you identified your seven back then. What are some of those things that are like, I change when it becomes threatened? Hmm. Such an interesting time for me to revisit those questions because, well, obviously, collectively, we have all just endured an entire year of loss. Mm. I mean, yeah. the, some of the, uh, this, the things that we have held dear have been 100% unavailable to us. Mm. And so um, this has already been a year of restraint. It has already been a year where some of our things have been threatened. Mm -hmm. Um, people have lost their health and they have lost their jobs and they have lost their homes. And so there's this collective sense right now of, um, of, of these questions that you're asking. And then like personally, so of course we experienced all that too. We experienced a huge loss of income and connection. And we haven't had church in a year. I mean, so many things are gone. And then also, uh, for me, uh, unsu- so surprisingly, just shockingly, right in the middle of all this other loss, I lost a 26 year marriage. Yeah. And uh, there was just like no bottom. There was just, there was a, a, no bottom to the sorrow, mm-hmm. like to the suffering, to the things that I had held pretty tightly. I felt like I had nothing left. Like yeah. there, every, everything's been taken, everything's gone. Um, but what I've learned now, and that was last summer, um, and here in March is, um, I, I was able to hang on to the good stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, it's all I had left. I didn't, I didn't make this choice. I didn't choose it. It's just all I had left. So I don't need a parade. That's just my other stuff was taken away. Mm. The stuff that I held a lot of identity inside and, um, security, inside. And so what I have left with these true, sincere relationships in my life, my family, my best friends, my faith community, it is everything. So now I know I can answer pretty genuinely that virtually all that other stuff can be challenged. It can be taken. Mm. It can be stolen. Um, it can get up and walk out on its own two legs. Yeah. And I still have what matters. Mm. Like I do. I have what matters. I have my faith hung on. It's intact. The best parts of it. Um, I've got love in my life. I have joy and connection. I have meaning. Mm. Um, and so this is not just, none of this is a joke. We, yeah. the stuff that we think is our primary identifiers. Mm. It may be, not, it, maybe it isn't. Maybe they aren't. Yeah. Um, Maybe we actually can do with less in a way that still creates tons of flourishing. Mm. Um, And that's what I'm learning right now. Yeah. 
oh man, that is so good. And I don't even feel like I have anything close to, you know, I, I, I didn't ask you this before we hopped on and I was not going to direct you to that place. I was going to leave it open to you, whether you wanted to, to talk about that. Um, is there, is it hard to have this book coming out when the marriage is, you know, that's the time that that was there, you know, that yep, that's part of the story. Really hard um, element to it and yeah. revisiting it. Um, even just this last calendar year as I was mm-hmm. revising and getting it updated was sad yeah. and weird. Mm. Um, these were, this was a f- family experiment yeah. and these were practices we were learning as not just a family, but as a couple, mm. these were ideas that meant a lot to us together. Yeah. And so now to kind of be alone in it is lonely. Yeah. And, and it's sad, but it doesn't make it any less true. Mm -hmm. And so, um, again, I'm having to reassign weight to what's good, true and beautiful Mm -hmm. and who owns it and who gets to keep it Mm -hmm. and how does it survive the worst of the worst? Yeah. And the weird thing is it does. Mm. That's the weird thing. That's the shock of it all Mm. is that, I mean, here I'm sitting today in my office having literally experienced the worst year of my life Mm. in, in unimaginable ways, in ways that are haunting and it's all still there. It's the good stuff is still there. And so, um, I'm still loved and, I still matter and I have value and my people are here and I love them and they love me. And the, the craziest thing in the world is that we live, Mm. we live, Mm. that we suffer, we lose, we fail, we're left and we live. It's Mm. just, it's a miracle every time. Yeah. You know, so, um, when I was like thinking about like what my answer would be, and this is just like, you know, what, what is that thing that when it gets taken I become different. Like I become grumpy or I, you know, everything kind of falls apart for me and, um, it's nothing as hard as that, but it is this like thing of, you mentioned like kind of the, some of the stuff you were going through the first round where you were dealing with like the, um, approval and the position and the, you know, achievements and the like recognition for the achievements. And I feel like lay all that down after the original project. Yep. I feel like that's like, like, that's my answer now is like, you know, like I talked about earlier, like leaving the trailer and you go and you run and you run and you run and you're trying to build this good life and build, 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 build. And it's like, like you get to this point. Here's what I, here's what I like compare it to Jen. It's like, I feel like I've been running a marathon and I got to the end and I'm like doubled over and trying to catch my breath and I'm exhausted. And somebody taps me on the shoulder and they're like, you entered the wrong race. Mm -hmm. You know, like you you got to go start over over here and like figure out like all this stuff that like matters and and exists when it, when like, you know, social media is a shouting void. Like there aren't a line of people saying, good job, you like, you know, all this stuff. Um, The question I have for you is kind of the flip side of that. You mentioned like that leadership kind of becomes lonely that, um, you know, the more eyes that are on things you, you, you're talking about, I think maybe even in the original text about like people are starting to see some eyes on this and it starts to feel lonely that, that like the more people around you are looking, it feels lonely. Is there, was there ever a time during this last year that you would have maybe even for a second entertained a month if you could unring a bell and go back to having just seven followers, for mm. example, seven eyes oh, on what yeah. was happening? Oh gosh. Yeah. Oh sure. Yes, absolutely. Um, and, and in more than one way, if in more than one context, mm. um, it, it's a, it's leadership is sobering. It is very, very sobering. Yeah. And, uh, and it doesn't evaporate just because your life is unraveling. And so, um, all of a sudden a very personal, personal sense of suffering. It's just public cause it is, yeah. um, and so, yeah, there've been tons of times mm-hmm. in the last 10 years. I was like, when I wrote Simple and Free, originally a seven, I had, let's see. Well, first of all, Instagram wasn't even around. Mm-hmm. We didn't have that yet. It was a yeah. completely different time. Yeah. Twitter was newish. 
Hmm. I was on Facebook, but I had a personal page, yeah. which meant you have to be under 5,000 followers. Yeah. That when, when seven came out, I had a personal Facebook page under 5,000 followers. Yeah. I'm like, I was like close to 800,000 now. It's different. Yeah. Um, and it's a lot of eyes mm. and it's a lot of attention. And so, um, I, I carry a deep sense of responsibility mm. as a leader. Yeah. My words matter. They mm. matter. And it's not because I'm so important, um, but they have weight. I have influence and people are listening and paying attention and watching. And so um, more now than ever, I try to be really, really careful with my words. I try yeah. not to be careless. Um, 10 years ago, pretty careless. Yeah. Um, I just throw it out there and like, well, let the chips fall where they may. Mm. That's not a um, wise way mm. to live on this. So yeah, do I sometimes wish that I didn't even have a social media account. Yes. Yeah. I have some friends who aren't even on it. They don't, they don't even have it. They're like, Oh, I don't have, it. I'm like, Oh yeah. Tell, tell me about that. Yeah. <laughs> but at the same time, the community that I have, which is located online mm. is so vibrant. Yeah. It's so beautiful. It has, it has been the impetus for such good work in the world mm. for absolutely true and real connections, friendships that are forever. I, I, I would never want to leave it behind entirely, yeah. but whew, when, when I went back through the project and was kind of examining how have these, how have these tenants stayed true to me for 10 years? What, yeah. what, what, what are, where am I still like, yes, that changed me. And mm. we are still in that. This was the one that I was like, <sighs> media and technology. When mm. I got to that chapter, I was like, well, damn it. <laughs> Not only am I kind of in pretty similar space as when I started that one, I, it's worse. Mm. It's worse. There's more, we have more to choose from now. Yeah. We have, a, we have 10 million more apps to choose from delivery service. It's all there. My kids are older. They're 10 years older. So now media and, te and technology for them mm. is a completely different animal yeah. than it was when they were just in elementary school, um, originally. And, this, this is the, that's the one. It's still the one. Yeah. I'm still trying to figure out what does it mean to consume mm. media and technology in a way that is faithful and healthy. Mm. And I don't know. Yeah. So when, when people start reading simple and free, I want to have this conversation. I, I realize this, this is still a major growth point for me yeah. that I'm interested in pressing into. Yeah. I love that. You, um, you talk a little bit, there's like a line where you talk about how cynicism had wreaked some havoc on your gentleness and your yeah. humility. And that was written in the original version. That was written before yeah. the fire you walked through the last year, the fire you were, walked through the years yeah. before that. So do, do you feel like 2021 Jen has been able to walk through that stuff and keep cynicism at bay? Did cynicism come back to protect you at all a little bit? Did it, or try to protect you a little bit? Like where was cynicism for the last few years? Mm. I've learned a lot in the ensuing 10 years mm. and I've experienced a lot. Yeah. And so, um, when I originally wrote seven and this was part of the bracketed instruction, I went mm. back and gave to myself. Yeah. I was very much at the time in the center of the bullseye of evangelical subculture. Mm. Um, and so my language was from that place. My concepts were from that place. Yeah. Um, my theology was from that place, my understanding. And so I had just very recently emerged um, from sort of the mega church culture, which you re you referred to earlier. And it had left me very, very jaded at the time. Mm. And, but since <laughs> good night, I mean, I don't know how to say this without sounding cynical, but the church has at large has, cont has disappointed me in ways mm. in the last even five years that I could never have imagined. Mm. Um, sh it has shocked me. It has left me feeling spiritually orphaned. Mm. Um, the, the, the faith and instruction that I grew up under apparently has no relevance anymore. It, it appears to me to have no real meaning mm. um, anymore. And so fortunately, 
I'd already done a lot of spiritual work around this. I had already really worked through, I know these terms are overused. We need to probably come up with better ones, but <laughs> I'd already really done my own personal spiritual deconstruction and mm-hmm. reconstruction. And that's the part that matters. That's the point I want to press into. Yeah. Um, I had reconstructed. I just didn't leave it in rubble. Uh, I'm like, if this stuff has no meaning, yeah. what does, Right. What what's real? Like yeah. what's true and good. And there's plenty, mm. there's plenty there. There's plenty left. And so I think having really already fought for some of those victories mm. in my faith, yeah. um, had really already suffered catastrophic loss from those earlier communities, mm. um, where, you know, I'm really not a part of anymore and, um, both by choice and by force. Yeah. Um, um, I am so grateful to have in my possession this last year, a soft heart. Yeah. So grateful that I already did that work. Mm. So grateful that that was my prize. Yeah. At the end of that was tenderness, was gentleness again, was hope, was even, I hate to even say it, optimism. Mm. I mean, what in the world, how dare I? (laughs) Um, And yet that has served me so beautifully this year. Yeah. So so beautiful. I am not shattered. Mm. I am not ruined. I am not laying on the ground still thinking my life is over. I am, I'm not doomed. I do not feel, um, I do not feel ruined. Mm. I still, I mean, having lost really everything that I could possibly imagine at this point that seemed important to me, I still am sitting here with a tender heart and open and love and I'm looking to the future with bright eyes. It's just crazy. Like Mm. God can do that in us. He really can. He can do that in us. We have to cooperate. Like yeah. we have to hand it over and, and do the work alongside of him, but he can really create that in us. And, Oh, I've never been, I've never been more grateful yeah. um, for a soft heart than this year. Mm, mm. That is so, I, I feel like um, we, as you were describing it, I was picturing, you know, like there's that whole, what happens to a potato versus what happens to an egg in hot water. And one gets tender and one gets really hard. And it's like, the, the hard times like show you what you're made of, what's on the inside. And I know that's like a very like cheesy, probably overdone, but like, I was also kind of picturing like, um, like when we tenderize meat, like we can go through a beating, but we come out the other side. If we can come out the other side, not like we don't become hard to what has put us through that, but we actually become tender, more tender to the world. We become that soft place to land in dirt. I actually talk about, um, my very scientific theory that we're born into the world with hard edges and we're bumping around into each other, leaving these cuts on one another, death by a thousand Mm -hmm. cuts, Mm 10,000 cuts. But the hard things we go through are like progressively finer grits of sandpaper rounding off the hard edges. And we go through that because, or, or, a great result of that is we get to be soft people, soft places to land yeah. for other people. Yes. And that's what I hear when you describe that is like the people who are going to be able to look to you as a soft place to land because yeah. it did not break you and it actually left you and made you more tender. I think that's beautiful. Um, I want to talk really quickly before I let you go here about, you know, you're one of the things you're very intentional when you're talking about this process, this letting go of excess is making a distinction between what most people think of as a fast, which is like abstinence, it's denial, it's all of these things versus what you call the Isaiah 58 um, fast. And you say, um, you know, this is not about the mechanics of abstinence. It's from, it's a fast from self-obsession, greed, apathy, and elitism. Mm -hmm. And that phrase self-obsession in particular, when you combine everything that I'm reading in this book of yours with that strawberry quote I read earlier, like Mm -hmm. I, it was like this moment of like, I I'm choking on this, Mm. the slushy I'm choking on the consuming and the more and the trying to achieve and be enough of something and put it out there and launch a book, launch a book, launch a book. And like, I just like, I want to be free of that. So talk a little bit about like fasting is not about what you're denying yourself of. It's like Mm -hmm. what you're freeing yourself of. Yeah, it is. It is. So for everybody who feels like kind of caught in the machine, mm-hmm. caught under the Slurpee machine, um, which is most of us. It is like yeah. my experience of the, of our communities, primarily of women are that we all feel mm-hmm. we're, like we're drowning in a lot of these cat in a lot of these ways. Um, and the majority of us do not know what to do. That's what the data says. I don't know. I don't know how to, I don't know how to stop. Yeah. I don't know how to slow down. I don't know how to change our systems and rhythms um, to create the life I actually want. I do, 
as Shauna said, I do not know how to get from here to there. Yeah. Enter fasting. Mm. Honestly. I mean, that is the, that is what it does. It is a physical mechanism. Mm. Um, it, it, it's flesh and bones and it's life. It's yeah. tactile. It's, it's tangible. It is a physical mechanism to get from here to there. Yeah. And so you got to put a little faith in it. I get that. Mm. I mean, we're just not a people of restraint. It's not our deal. You know, that is not our deal. Mm. Um, you have to put a little bit of faith in that possibility, what it, what it's offering to us. Yeah. This is, this is an offering mm. if you're willing to take it. Um, and it will get us from here to there. I, I mentioned in, um, as I got to the end of the original project, I said something along the lines of, I have learned now having curbed my appetites for almost an entire year. Yeah. Um, it started in January, ended after Thanksgiving. So almost a whole year having curbed my appetites for that long, my appetites have changed. Mm. It's just true. It fasting was an, it was an offering to me. Mm. Uh, it was offering to me. Um, and then ultimately something that I was able to offer to God and say, what might happen here? Is this how to get from here to there? Yeah. And I got to the end of it and realized I was not nearly as hungry for the things that I started out being hungry for. Yeah. Um, my hunger was satiated mm. and I found that I was hungry for other things that lasted. Mm. So really and truly it's, it's pretty incredible. It's pretty incredible what it can do. It is it is a pathway for us if we're yeah. willing to just give it a try. Yeah. What do you say to the woman who has already apparently said this to you of this is not the year. Don't come at me no, with this book. Jen. Don't come at me with this book. What do you say to that woman? If you had to make one like pitch to them, like, no, 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 this is absolutely the year. This is the time. What would you say to her? Yeah, I know. Bless. And, and I understand <laughs> the impulse having already gone through a forced mm. reduction yeah. and restraint in the whole world. Mm. Like I get it. Uh, I get the impulse to want to go, no, this is the year of more, more of everything. Right. Um, so I would just say to you, I couldn't agree. I, I'm in complete agreement, complete alignment, but let's choose our more. Mm. Like, what do you really want more of? Do yeah. you really want just more things? Is that what, is that what your, is that what your instincts are suggesting to you mm. that more things are going to be fill this gaping hole that we have as a community? If, if not, I mean, if yes, then okay, that's one category. But if, if what you're hungry for is more, I'm telling you, you'll get it like this. Yeah. This is a path to more, but it's the more that you're going to want. It's, yeah. it's the more that's going to fulfill you. It is the more that's going to serve your family. It's the more that's going to increase your own generosity and compassion and joy. I promise. Mm. Like this is a more, yeah. um, I know on its face, it's a less. Um, but it is the more I think we are so hungry for. I mean, honestly, after a year of being so disconnected from each other, yeah. so disconnected from our world, um, I think, I actually think we're ready for all these categories to be more. Yeah. And so this is one way to get there. Mm. It's one way to remember how to start the engine. I mean, we are an idol right now. We are mm. absolutely idling. Um, this is one way to start the engine and go, how do I re-engage the world now, finally, mm. in a way that is magnificent, mm. in a way that I want to, in a way that I'm going to be so happy I chose one year, five years, 20 years from now. Yeah. I think that's what we've got our, on our plate here. Yeah, I love it. You say, are there people far, far ahead of us already? Um, yes. Yeah. Will we be cringy or awkward or clueless? Also, yes. Yeah. Will we look back 10 years later and be shocked at what shocked us then? Probably. Yeah. But the alternative is looking back and realizing we never moved at all. We are still standing in the exact same spot. The arena was too daunting. We lost a decade. Beautiful. Beautiful. Jen, where can they find you? Where can they find this book? Where can they find yeah. the podcast? All the things. Yeah. I'm, I think I'm the only Jen Hatmaker out there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is my handle everywhere. Yeah. Jen Hatmaker on all the socials. Um, and then Simple and Free is going to be everywhere books are sold. It comes out May 23rd or March 23rd, excuse me. Um, and then I have a, a podcast that I love too, and it's called For the Love. And mm -hmm. you can find that at um, jenhatmaker.com. And it's everywhere podcasts are heard yeah. um, and consumed. And so thanks for letting me talk about it today. I yeah. am so, I'm just still so enthusiastic. I still believe in it so much. And it's just, it was just a joy to come into your space and get to 
have a great conversation with you. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for being here. And friends, you are going to want to check this out. The book is Simple and Free, Seven Experiments Against Excess. It's out now. Everywhere books are sold. Get this into your hands. Make sure you keep the conversation going with us now as Jen and I head over to our new YouTube channel for The Mary Morant Show. It's linked in the show notes below, or you can head to marymorantz.com slash YouTube. And over there, you're going to get even more bonus content not featured here in the episode where I'm going to be asking Jen specifically which of the seven has stuck the most and which one she has fallen back into the most as well. Until next time, friends, this is The Mary Morant Show. Mary Morant Show.